Well, last week we kicked off this series called I'm Okay, and if you weren't here last week, you can see the outside of that, of that word okay is really surrounded by the word broken. And actually, the, the root word of broken in this, in this case is actually okay. And so one of the things we talked about last week is how so often in life it's easy to pretend like we're okay when we're not okay. It's easy to go through life being broken, but actually look at, on the outside like we're actually doing just fine. And we said, I said last week that fine is a four-letter word in our house. It's, it is a four-letter word in general, but it's a four -letter, if somebody is fine, they're really not fine. If somebody is okay, they're probably not okay. And that, that Jesus shows up most when we admit that our brokenness and that we can't be transformed by the power of God and by the grace of Jesus if we don't admit that we're broken and we actually need a Savior and that pretending to be okay when we're not okay actually stunts spiritual growth. It doesn't enhance it. And today I want to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture and I want to look at a family that looked like they were okay but they were extremely broken. And it's a parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. Actually, it's the third parable that he tells in a series of three parables in Luke chapter 15. It's probably my favorite chapter of the entire New Testament because it's so rich and it gives us an insight into God's heart and it gives us an insight into the heart that Jesus wants us to have as a church. And to give you a context for what takes place in the three parables that Jesus tells, to look at the first two verses of Luke chapter 15, it says this, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now, it's important to know that this sets the context for all three stories that Jesus is going to tell in Luke chapter 15. There is something that's going on in Jesus's ministry where people who were nothing like Jesus, like Jesus. See, religion in, in this culture was reserved for people who pretended to be okay even when they weren't okay. They went by the religious law. They, they observed the religious rules. They propped themselves up on religious doctrine. They, they acted like they had their life together even if they did not have their life together. And Jesus has spent so the majority of his ministry flying in the face of this mindset and this philosophy. And he begins to associate, not just associate with tax collectors and other notorious sinners. I like how on close, you know, tomorrow's April 15th, how tax collectors are, you know, associated with notorious sinners, right? They're all in the same sentence together, all right? We all feel that way. And IRS, bad, all right? And so, um, but Jesus not just associates with them. If you look what, he, what it happens, he starts eating with them. And to share a Jewish meal was a very big deal. Like if you allowed yourself to eat with somebody, what it communicated was that you had deep fellowship with that person. You had, a, you had a deep relationship with that person. And so Jesus not only invites them into his teaching circle, he invites them into his relational circle. And this makes the Pharisees and religious leaders furious. Ultimately, it's this philosophy of ministry that would get Jesus crucified. Okay, so as we go into Holy Week, as we think, start thinking about the crucifixion and turning our, our minds and hearts toward the crucifixion of Christ as we look at Good Friday, it's, it's this Fury, it's this anger, it's this resentment that fueled the religious leaders to orchestrate the crucifixion of Christ because he was claiming to be the Son of God and God would never associate with people like that. God would never have a meal with notorious sinners. And so before we, before we dive into the actual parable, this illustrates this idea that Jesus goes searching for people religion has rejected. Like that's the heart of Christ. That's the mission, that's the ministry of Jesus. That Jesus goes searching for people. He goes running after people that religion have rejected. Okay, so that sets us up for Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 11 through uh, 22. It says this. To illustrate this point further, Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. And so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money on wild living. About this time, as money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home 
to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And so the party began. I love that last phrase. And so the party began. Just, let's, just, let's just throw a party. That's where hangover comes in. Okay, that's right there. Okay, they're, they're throwing a party. They kill the fattened calf. They pop up with some wine and boom. Every, every day, you and I have a choice of how we're going to live our life. In the context of this story, we can live our life one of two ways. We can live our life at home with the Father. And when I'm at home with the Father, I, I sense the pleasure of God. When I'm at home with the Father, I know that my identity is not in what I do or what, do I, what I accomplish. It's in who God says I am. When I'm at home with the Father, I feel protected. I feel known. I feel valued. I feel a deep intimacy with God. When I'm at home with the Father, I don't have to question and look at my finances and look at my relationships and, and look at my job and look at all of the things that are circumstantial around me and think that my life is falling apart because I know the one who holds my future. When I'm at home with the Father, I have a deep sense of peace and comfort. When I'm at home with the Father, I know that I'm a beloved child of God. That's my identity. That's who I am. That's, the, that's how I live. But also in the context of this story, there's another way of doing life. And it's to be in a distant country. And when, when I'm in a distant country, I feel anxious and I feel insecure. When I'm in a distant country, it's easy for me to justify sin and to compromise my values and my moral standards. When I live in a distant country, I'm easily angered or irritated or stressed out. And you and I can choose to live every single day of our life at home with the Father, or we can choose to live in a distant country. But Jesus knew that for each of us, at some time in our life, we would choose to leave the security and the blessing and the provision of being at home with the Father, and we would choose to go to a distant country. And so he tells this story of this boy who chooses to leave home. And it's what we call the prodigal son. Right? That's not something that Jesus calls him. It's something that Bible translators have titled this story, the story, the parable of the prodigal son. And so what I want to do today with the time that I have is I want to walk you through four stages of being a prodigal. And how that fits into where we're going next weekend and who we really want to be as a church. And the first stage of this prodigal's life, and the first stage of our life when we choose to go to a distant country, is the temptation stage. And temptation is this belief that God is holding out on me. And really, the temptation stage starts before this story even begins. Look at verse 12. It says this, The younger son told his father, I want my share of, estate, of your estate now before you die. It's this underlying feeling that God is holding me back. And one day the thought occurs to this son that his life would be better if he didn't live with his dad. That living with the father is boring. Living with the father is, is restricting. Living with the father is, is just this life of, of working in his fields and obeying his rules and going by his standards and doing everything that he says he, he, that he needs done. Li living at home with the father is, is not the life that I know that I could live if I was out on my own. And so he says to himself, you know what, I would be happier if I didn't have to work in his fields and eat at his table and obey his rules. I would be happier if I did my own thing. If I went my own way, if I was my own boss. And here's the truth. All of us at times in our life, we say to ourselves, you know what, I think I can run my life better than God can. I think I can run my career better than God can. I think I can run my marriage better than God can. I think I can run my dating life better than God can. I think I can run my relationships better than God can. We all have this tendency to believe that God is holding us back. That, that the, the standards and the life and the, and the holiness and the purity and the um, transformation that God has called us to is really just something that's optional, that we really know how to live our life and direct our life and and run our life in a way that brings us more life than God ever could. We don't say it out loud. We just internally believe that to be true. 
And what I love about God and what I love about Jesus is Jesus knew this about us. And so he tells this story that relates to all of us about this boy who says, you know what? I would be much happier in a distant country. And maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you're on your way to a distant country because you know what? You're tired of being faithful at home. You're always faithful. You always show up. You always come through. Your, your, your kids always can count on you to come through with a last minute project or a last minute, you know, a last minute trip or a last minute something. Your husband can always count on you to come through with whatever he needs. Your wife can always count on you to come through with whatever she needs. Your, your boss can always count on you. You're always the faithful one. And you're tired of being what you feel like is the doormat of everyone else. And you want to live your own life. And so maybe you haven't even moved out in real life, but you've moved out in your heart. And you've resigned yourself that God could ever give you the life that you know you could give yourself. And that's exactly what this kid does. He says, you know what, my life would be happier if I could just leave home. But here's what he never does. He never thinks this all the way through. He never thinks about what his life is going to look like outside the provision and the love and the care of his father. He just thinks, I got to get out of here. Back in October, um, we were gearing up for Halloween. And uh, as many of you guys know, two years ago, almost two years ago, we adopted two, two kids. And they were nine and 11 at the time. Or no, they're nine and 11 now. They were eight and 10 at the time. And, um, and they had never experienced Halloween. They never dressed up, never had a costume. And so, uh, so Halloween, not this last year, but the year before that was their first Halloween. And, and so we're gearing up for Halloween because it's a big deal to them. And and our neighborhood has um, a parade that kind of kicks off trick-or-treating. And so we all gather at this one street, and uh, we go on this kind of this walk around the circle. And then once we get around the circle, all the kids just kind of run, and they go, all go trick-or-treating. And uh, it's kind of a big deal in our, in our neighborhood. Well, um, Janiah, our daughter, I won't tell you what she had done, but she did something pretty significant, and she got grounded from trick-or-treating. And it was like we were ruining her life, all right? It was like, it was like that she, she, we were the worst parents of all time, and she even said, you're ruining my life, okay? And, and so uh, she was taking it pretty dramatically, and, and so they, she'd had, she had had a couple of good days, and so I was going to give her grace, and I was going to let her go in the parade and let her dress up in her costume. At first, she was not even going to dress up. She was going to sit on the porch and give out candy. How tortured am I as a father, right? They're just not like, we're horrible parents, all right? And that's what she's going to do. She's going to sit in street clothes, handing out candy. And uh, I, I, you know, I, was, I, I took away that I was going to make her tell why she got grounded, but we didn't go there, okay? So, so she's going to sit in street clothes, hand out candy. I was like, you know what? She's been good the last couple of days. I'll give her, we'll give her back her costume. We're going to give her some grace. And then she can go in the parade. And then she can come back in her costume and we can hand out candy. She comes home from school and goes upstairs and comes downstairs, and, I, and I, don't, I don't hear from her or see her. And so I said to Trish, I said, hey, where's Janiah at? She's like, she's upstairs, changing her costume. I'm like, she's not upstairs. I'm not kidding you. 30 seconds later, I get a call on my cell phone from an 873 number, which says, says Zionsville, Indiana. I've never seen it, didn't know, but I, something prompted me, not send it to voicemail, just to answer it. So I answered it. It was a police officer. He said, are you Justin Davis? I said, yes, I am. He said, I have your daughter in the back of my police car. I'm like, what? So I, I meet him out front, and uh, Trisha's doing something. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why I didn't bring her into this, but I just said, hey, I said, I'm going out to talk to this police officer. So I go out. The police officer says, seems like your daughter got off the bus and walked the wrong way. I'm like, well, I don't think that's what happened, but okay. And so we walk in, and I told Trisha, and Trisha's like, oh, no. And so she goes and chases down the police officer. And uh, so the police officer comes back and she's, he gets out of the car and she's like, Janiah, tell him what happened. She's like, um, my parents grounded me from trick-or-treating. And so I was running away, going to find a family that would let me go trick-or-treating tonight. Well, what she found was a mile from our house, a lady seeing a little eight-year-old girl walking in her front yard and called the cops, all right? But she had this in her mind that my life would be better if I had another family that would go, let me go trick-or-treating. And I ran away from home when I was little, but nobody even noticed, all right? Like, I didn't run away. I went and hid underneath the porch, and nobody even noticed for like an hour that I felt totally defeated, right? And so all of us have this belief that life would be better apart from God. 
And if you live your life in a distant country, it takes you to the next stage, and this is the action. Or if you live your life long enough in the temptation stage, it takes you next to the action stage. And the action stage is this, I deserve to do life my way. Look at verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all of his money in wild living. You see, this son has convinced himself that he has the right to his father's estate. He has the right to his father's property. He is so discontent that discontentment leads him to entitlement. And that really is what discontentment is, right? Discontentment in your life, it's, if, you're, if you don't acknowledge discontentment in your life early on, discontentment is the gateway drug to entitlement. It leads you straight into this, these three words, you owe me. And everybody in your life owes you. Everybody in your life is, is, is somebody that, that needs to pay up. Your spouse owes you, your kids owe you, God owes you, your employer owes you. Your friends owe you, look at all that you do for them. And you have this sense of discontentment. If you don't check that in your heart on a, on a daily basis, you begin to live as though the world owes you and God owes you. And that's exactly where this son gets to. This young son believes that his father owes him. And not only does his father owe him, his father owes him everything he would get after he dies, before he dies. Ken Bailey is this New Testament um, scholar, he's a, he writes um, commentaries on the New Testament, and he lives in the Middle East. And this is what he wrote as it pertains to this Luke chapter 15 passage about this son. He says, for 15 years, I've been asking people of all walks of life about the implication of a son's request for his father's inheritance while his father is still living. For 15 years, I've been asking people, and the response is always the same. Has anyone ever made such a request in your village? So he is in the Middle East asking about this request for a son to demand, not even, a, not even a younger son, just a son in general, to demand his father's inheritance before his father dies. Never, they say. Could anyone ever make such a request? Impossible, they reply. If anyone ever did, what would happen? His father would beat him, of course. Why, I ask. The request means that he wants his father to die. And so you, this younger son doesn't have the right that the older son would have to his father's estates. He still has some rights, but he would not get 50%. The older son would get the majority of the father's estate. And this younger son comes to his father and he says, hey, I don't want you to die. I just want to live as if you've already died. I want to live my life as if you're dead right now. And in some ways what happens in this passage next is really the most remarkable thing. The father grants his request. The father doesn't beat him. The father doesn't punish him. The father doesn't kick him out of the family. The father doesn't stop talking to him. To Jesus' listeners, this would have been outlandish for the father to respond this way. He agrees to divide his wealth 50-50. And to Jesus' listeners, this would have been incredible. Not only does the father allow his son to do this because no normal father would do this, he also allows his son to leave home. And this is what's so incredible about this passage of scripture. You know, Luke chapter 15 is filled with three three parables. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. And it's that that song we sang last week, Reckless Love. It's where we get that line, leave the 99 to find the one, right? The parable of the lost sheep is about this shepherd who loses one sheep and he leaves 99 sheep in this passionate pursuit to find the one sheep. The next parable is this parable of the lost coin and this lady loses, loses an amount of money. She loses a coin in her house. And the Bible says, Jesus says in this parable that, that she flips her house upside down. She turns her house upside down. She goes to all of her neighbors asking if they had seen this coin. And those two parables are illustrative, no doubt, but they, are, they actually just illustrate what any normal person would do. A shepherd in that culture, if they lost one sheep, they would leave the 99 to go find the one. If a lady lost an amount of money, she would turn her house upside down to find that amount of money. But this story is outlandish because it illustrates a father that allows his children to have free will and to leave home, even when that free will, even when that choice to give their, his children free will damages his heart and brings tremendous pain to his heart. God wants us to, to realize that he wants to be in a relationship with us, not based out of obligation, 
Not based out of rules and regulations, but based out of love. And so Jesus tells that this, this father allows his son to leave home and move to a distant country. And after that, the next stage is inevitable, and that's the pain stage. Pain is that we, re, we experience the consequences of our choices. Look at verses 14 and six, through 16. It says, about this time, about the time the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Isn't that how it happens, right? You got all this money in the world, and then you happen to run out of money right when, you know, a famine strikes. And so this famine begins to sweep over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Here's the reality, and some of you guys know this from, from experience. I know that I know this from personal experience. If you live in a distant country long enough, you're going to experience pain. If you live away from the Father's protection and away from the Father's blessing and away from the Father's way of life long enough, pain isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because what we, have, what we view oftentimes as God's... Um, Rules is actually his protection. What we view oftentimes as God's restrictions is actually his protection. And so once we move out from that, pain is a natural byproduct of some of the choices that we make. And how you and I respond to pain really defines our spiritual journey. You can mask the pain. You can medicate the pain. You can try to escape the pain. For those of us that have been a part of church culture for a while, religious culture for a while, you can take the pain and to pretend that you're okay when you're really broken. You, you can try to live your life as if the pain doesn't affect your heart or you can face up to the pain in your life. You, you can acknowledge that you've been running from pain. You've been trying to avoid pain. You've been trying to avoid the consequences. You've been resenting it. You've been avoiding it. You've, pre you've been pretending it away. And how you and I respond to pain, most of us don't change until the pain of our circumstances becomes greater than our fear of change. You realize that, right? That's why we repeat the same sins over and over and over again. So we, that's why we have the same patterns in our family over and over and over again. Some of the things that you struggle with, your parents probably struggled with. And it's because our fear of change, our fear of being found out, our, feeling of, our, feeling, our fear of being vulnerable is actually greater than the pain that we're experiencing. And so as long as we can mask the pain or pretend the pain away, we're probably not gonna change. But when that pain becomes great enough that it forces us to change, typically that's when we pursue transformation. That's exactly what happens in this young boy's life. He realizes, you know what? I am feeding pigs right now. The, the, the servants in my father's house eat better than I do. What is my life right now? And so he comes to the next stage and the final stage, which is the decision. Will I, will I allow my pain to define me or transform me? Look at verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. This kid, he, he kind of comes to his senses. And he says, oh my gosh. I could stay in the guest quarters. I could stay in the servants' quarters and it'd be nicer than where I'm sleeping right now. I could eat the scraps off of my father's table and it would be better than the food that I have right now. And so he comes to his senses and he composes this little speech. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, like when I first like, started calling girls, like when I was like seventh grade, you know, I'd call them and hang up. It was kind of prank calling me, you know, but then you kind of compose this little speech, you rehearse this little thing you're going to say, right? Because you want to impress somebody, right? Maybe if, you've got, if you're not good at confrontation, maybe you write out bullet points of confrontation because you don't want to say the wrong thing. Some of you are laughing, that, like, that, 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 that's you, okay? I called you out, all right? That's all. Um, but this, this kid, he, he composes this little speech and he says, you know what, I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to say, hey, I'm no longer worthy of being called your son, so take me back as a hired servant. See, this, this son is going to go home, but he's not going to go home as a son. He's going to go home as a servant. He doesn't even feel worthy anymore of being a son. He knows he doesn't deserve the father's love, and so he's signing up for the servant plan. And maybe that's how some of you feel in your relationship with God. You've been doing this relationship with God thing for quite a while, and you don't feel like a son or daughter. You feel like a servant. You don't feel like God loves you for you. You feel like God loves you only based on your performance. You don't even know what it means to live in an unconditional relationship with Jesus because you're always trying to impress him. You're always trying to, um, 
to live up to his standards. You're always trying to obey his rules. You've never really grasped the unconditional grace of God because you're constantly trying to perform your way into a relationship with him. And this son that had everything, and he left the father's blessing and provision and home, he says, you know what, I'm not even worthy to be a son, and so I'm going to go home as a hired servant. And so this desperate, starving boy, he makes his way home, and the prodigal arrives in the village, and he's so skinny that you can't even recognize him, and he's probably dirty, and he probably stinks, and he probably has stains all over his clothes, and what was once nice clothes are probably ripped and torn and shredded. And he walks down the street, and now his house is visible. And then what happens next in the story is absolutely amazing. Verse 20, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. Jesus uses this phrase intentionally in this story, He says his father ran to him. That's a phrase that Jesus' listeners would have stepped back and said, what? Aristotle said, uh, noblemen never run, noblemen are run too. And so there was this feeling that if his dad really had the clout and really had the position of authority, he would never run to his son. His son disgraced him. His son ran out on him. His son embarrassed him. His son should grovel to him. And Jesus says, while he was a long way off, barely in the distance, which implies that the father had gone out looking for his son repeatedly. He was looking for him. He was waiting for him. And he took off after him. He ran to him. Jesus is saying, this is the heart of God. God runs to us as we make our way back to him. And what happens really next is there, there's no words. Filled with love and compassion, he not only runs to him, but he embraces him and he kisses him. And that word um, kisses, that he kisses him, it's imperative, which means it just repeats. So he kisses him over and 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 over again. He just kisses him, can't stop kissing him. He's dirty, he's mangled, he's completely wasted away. And this father doesn't see his appearance, he sees his son and he just kisses him over and over and over and over again. And that's God's heart for you. And that's God's heart for me. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how long you and I go to a distant country, God runs to us. He embraces us as sons and daughters, not as servants. If we're willing to cross the border and come back home, God takes the first Sprint. And finally, the son speaks. Verse 21, his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. And he doesn't go on any further. He doesn't say anything else. A lot of scholars believe it's because the father interrupts him in that moment. And the father says, oh, quick. Get a rope for his back. Get a ring for his finger. Get sandals for his feet. He says, quick, hey, get a robe. That robe represents family. It represents that he has come home. Get a ring for his finger. That represents his identity. Get a sandal for his feet. Because servants don't wear shoes, but sons do. So get sandals and get a robe and get a ring. Because this son of mine, and we're going to kill the fattened calf, because this son of mine who was lost has been found. This son of mine who was dead is now alive. And so we're going to party. The father wants everyone to know, the whole village to know, that his son is fully forgiven. Servants don't dress in the finest robe, sons do. Servants don't wear shoes, sons do. Servants don't have jewelry, sons do. And Jesus says, that's God's heart for you and that's God's heart for me. When just one person comes home, God goes running. You know, this Easter, we want to create a place where every single person that walks through that door they may be coming from a distant country. We have no idea what people are going to come in with. I have no idea what you come in with today. Next week, we're going to have a lot of guests. We're going to have people that haven't been here since Christmas. And they may be carrying years worth of baggage and years worth of regrets and years worth of living in a distant country. And we want to present them with a God who runs to them. 
because that's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. That's what he does for us. We want to be a place that goes searching for men and women who are far from God. It's the heart of our church. We want to help as many people as possible find hope. That's Jesus. And follow God. That's discipleship. There's a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. And I don't know if you've seen it. It's pretty gory. It's pretty gruesome. It's a war movie. It's a true story. It's based on a true story. I don't know if it's actually, it's not a documentary. But it's about this guy named Desmond Doss. And Desmond Doss was, um, he was Seventh-day Adventist. And so not only does that mean that he worshipped on Saturday and not Sunday, but his particular denomination doesn't believe in violence. They're pacifist. And so he refused, even though he got drafted into the army, he refused to carry a weapon. And the first part of the movie is all about how the army and his fellow soldiers gave him a hard time. He was beaten up. He was made fun of. He was, give, he was uh, almost court-martialed. And he actually got to the place where, because of his religious beliefs, he was actually given approval by the United States government not to carry a weapon. They said, basically, this is going to be, lead to your own demise. You're not going to have a way of protecting yourself. And so he became, he moved from being kind of ostracized to being really, he would pray before battles. He would pray for the soldiers. He would go and rescue soldiers and carry them to uh, medical tents. And in one of the last battles of the movie, um, he doesn't, it's one of the most gruesome and one of the most violent. And I think it's one where we lost the most lives. But it's also one that we want and eventually end up winning. And he has this prayer as he's running through the battlefield looking for people who are wounded. He prays, God, just help me find one more. He would drag somebody down to the cliff. They would lower him down to safety. And he would pray, God, help me find one more. And he would take off through the battlefield. Bullets flying everywhere. Bombs going off everywhere. He would drag somebody else to the cliff. They would lower him down to safety. God, help me find just one more. Seventy-five times he prayed that prayer. 75 men lived life after that battle because Desmond Doss prayed, help me find one more, and then sprinted after them. And you and I have an opportunity this week to help find one more for God, one more for the kingdom, one more. And every dollar that you give, every hour that you invest, every baby that you rock, every cup of coffee that you make, every door that you hold open, every person that you greet, every conversation that you have, every person that you hug and every person you help make feel welcome, you're helping the kingdom of God find one more, one more person who may be in a distant country, one more person who needs to find their way back home, one more person who is just waiting for someone to run to them and embrace them and not judge them and not ridicule them and not call out their sin but embrace them in spite of their sin. And this can be that place where we are not okay, we are broken, but we're broken and we're redeemed. We're sons and daughters that used to live in a distant country and now we've moved back home and we just want to make room for more. And that's our heart. And so every invitation you hand out this week, I want to, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to say just one more. Help me find one more. As you walk into work tomorrow morning, help me find just one more. As you're in your cul-de-sac this week, help me find just one more. Because I bet you know people who need hope. I bet you know people who are at the end of their rope. I bet you know people who have lived in a distant country and they're exhausted. They're tired. And they might just be waiting for an invitation. We sent out 15,000 postcards. They hit mailboxes yesterday. I think the most, most of them hit yesterday. Some of them hit on Monday. You know the return rate on a postcard that's sent out is 1%. And so theoretically speaking, we could have 150 extra people come to Easter because of that postcard. But you know that a personal invitation, 60% of people who say that if they were personally invited would, would attend church. And so we can, we can put all of our stock in, hey, we're just going to send out a postcard and we've done our duty to help people know about Easter, 1%. Or we can say, hey, I'm going to personally invite somebody to be a part of what God longs to do at Hope City and we can have a 60% return rate. And I know if some of you are faithful, some of you have been inviting people, the same people since we launched this church, but maybe it's just one more invitation. Maybe it's just one more conversation. 
And we don't want people here to come, you know, next week so they can believe what we believe. We want people to come to this place because we believe that Jesus brings dead things back to life. And that's what we want to celebrate next week. And I want to be a part of that with you. Let's pray together.